Welcome to the Canadian edition of The Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Everything I hear him saying is truth. I know it. The truth in his word literally comes from the Bible. The more you watch it, the more you realize it is the truth. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. I've only covered the first chapter in the first three days, but uh, man, it has been powerful. And we've got a brand new product. I've got a 223 page hardbound book that takes all of my commentary notes that are on this digital version of a living commentary. I've got a digital commentary that I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. And we've taken the Hebrews portion and put it into this 223 page hardbound book. And then we also have CDs and DVDs that were taken from my television program, or you can get a USB where you'll have the audio and the video on there. So I've already covered the first chapter of Hebrews. There's 13 chapters and I need to speed up on this, but I tell you, it's rich. And uh, the very first chapter of Hebrews is basically showing that Jesus is the greatest way that God ever communicated with us. He supersedes Moses. He supersedes the Old Testament law. He supersedes angels. And in the process of making that point, there were also things said about Jesus that showed about how he created the heavens and the earth. It elevates him way, way, way beyond a man. He was God manifest in the flesh. It uses Old Testament scriptures where God the Father called Jesus God. Man, those were some powerful things that we talked about in the previous uh, days. You know, let me just go back to one thing in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. I didn't really amplify on this, but it says that God the Father anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness above his fellows. This is saying that Jesus was the happiest or the gladdest person on the earth. Now, did you know the Bible also says that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief? Uh, John chapter 11 says that Jesus wept at the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, but he wasn't weeping because he was suffering. It was him taking our suffering. It was him having compassion on us. But this verse, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, says that he was anointed with the oil of gladness above all of his fellows. And so Jesus was, you've got to take these things and put them all into their proper perspective. Jesus rejoiced. He, he rejoiced when he saw people. He said that he rejoiced that, Father, you have revealed this unto babes and hid them from the wise and prudent. Jesus was not a sad person. And you know, much of the religious depiction of Jesus shows him as this, uh, man, I hate to use these terms, but this is really what religion does. It makes him look anal retentive, like he's always this sad person and things. I believe that one of the things that, you know, some of the modern uh, movies that have been put out about Jesus shows him laughing, shows him rejoicing. The musicals that we put on, one of the things that really blesses me is the guy who plays Jesus, Robert Murin, taking little children and just twirling around and playing with them and laughing with them. Did you know that traditionally that has not been the way that Jesus is presented? And yet Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9 says, He was anointed with the oil of gladness above all of His fellows. So that's an important piece of information that counters some of these religious traditions that we have about Jesus. As a whole, the first chapter of the book of Hebrews was written to show that Jesus supersedes the way that the law was communicated through angels. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore, and the word therefore when you see it means you need to look and see what it's there for. In other words, what it's relating back to what was said in the first chapter about Jesus being superior to all of the angels. In verse 1 of chapter 2, it says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So if the Old Testament that was communicated by angels was enforced 
and when people violated it, there were consequences to it. If that was true under the Old Testament, well, then the New Testament under Jesus is far superior, and we ought to give the more earnest heed. We ought to commit ourselves to it. It says, lest at any time we should let them slip. You know, the word that was translated, uh, let them slip, I'm not going to try and pronounce this word, but here's what it means. It means to flow by, that is figuratively, carelessly pass or miss. So this is saying that, you know, all of these awesome things that Jesus has done for us in the New Testament, they could pass you by. Even though Jesus purchased them, even though it's done, even though we have a new covenant, this covenant doesn't necessarily prosper you unless you reach out and lay hold on it. They can pass you by. And I'll even be as bold as to say that I believe that the vast majority, well over 50% of people who are truly born again are not taking advantage of the full covenant. I can say that based on my own personal experience. I got born again when I was eight years old, but I was 18, 10 years later before I really began to start understanding anything. I was saved and stuck. And then even after I had this miraculous encounter with the Lord in 1968, I bet you it was another 10 years before I really began to grasp some of the truths of the new covenant and understand grace instead of law, performance-based relationship. And here I am 56 years later, and I am still learning. I mean, as I'm studying the book of Hebrews the truths that, uh, about what Jesus has purchased for us are just coming alive to me. So I dare to say, based on my own personal experience, based on what I deal with so many other people, that very, very, very few Christians today have really entered into the new covenant and are fully taking advantage of what Jesus purchased for us in the new covenant. That's a radical statement, but I believe that that's true. And just like this verse says, We've let these things pass us by. We've let them slip. And he goes on to say in verse 2, he says, For if the word spoken by angels, talking about the Old Testament law, was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So if the Old Testament law, when people broke it, there was recompense, there was judgment, there was dealing with people based on that revelation, and yet if the new covenant is a greater revelation, which the whole first chapter of the book of Hebrews was trying to get that point across, if that's so, well then how do we think that we can get by under this new covenant of grace? I tell you, just because God is not executing His judgment on us under this new covenant the way He did under the old covenant does not mean that, therefore, our obedience and submission to the new covenant uh, is not mandatory. We need to be serving God. We need to be taking advantage of what Jesus purchased for us. And how are we expecting to escape? If the old covenant people couldn't escape the consequences of that covenant, how can we think that we can escape the consequences of this new covenant? Just because God isn't releasing His judgment in this life, I guarantee you there are still consequences by us not understanding these things. You know, there's a bumper sticker I've seen that says, uh, what you don't know won't hurt you. That's absolutely untrue. What you don't know is killing you. Or as Jesus put it, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you don't know the truth, then you aren't free. By default, we just fall under the condemnation. And I'm speaking to people right now who there may be some people watching this that have never committed their lives to the Lord, but most of the stations that I'm on are Christian stations, Christian networks. The majority of people watching this are people who are born again, and yet you're still living under depression, discouragement, sickness, poverty, fear, you're bitter, you have no hope. Not everybody, but there's many, many people who are Christians who are not living in the abundance that Jesus purchased for us. And it's just like this says, because we have uh, we've neglected these things. 
He goes on to say here, uh, let me just read this to you in the Amplified uh, Classic. It says, neglect and refuse to pay attention to. Or the Living Bible in Weymouth's New Testament translates this as we are indifferent to. It's not necessarily malicious that people who are truly born again don't walk in the new covenant, but they just haven't devoted any attention to it. They haven't disciplined themselves. They haven't studied You know, the Bible is amazing. There are millions of words in this Bible. This is a large Bible. I've got a relatively small Bible compared to a lot of people, but I guarantee you, you can't sit down and read this in one sitting. It takes a long time. Matter of fact, we have a Bible reading plan where you read about three or four chapters a day, and it takes a year to get through the entire Bible. There's a lot of material in here, and the average Christian does not know what it says. Did you know one of my classes in our Karis Bible College, I make the students read through the Bible in nine months. That's part of their first year curriculum. And if they were to make 100 on every single test, but if they don't do these Bible readings and if they don't fulfill that, the most they could make would be an 80. It's 20% of their grade is to read through the Bible. And some people think, well, that's restrictive and that's kind of legalistic. Man, I think that for you to come to a Bible college and never have read the Bible is wrong, (laughs) man. The Bible is our textbook. Until you get into the third year classes, we don't even use any other textbook. Everything is based on Scripture, on the Bible. And my point is that many Christians have never read the Bible. It takes effort to read through all of this and then to be able to distinguish, you know, like it says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's talking about that you have to study. And yet very few Christians study the word of God. This is the reason that I'm doing a verse by verse study through the book of Hebrews. And if you could stick with me or if you could get these products that we're offering, you need to put some effort into this lest you let this new covenant, all of these wonderful things that Jesus has provided for us, slip or neglect them. It doesn't mean that you have to be belligerent. It doesn't mean that I don't want to know what the Word says, but just let life get into the way and and just think that, you know, I just haven't got time to be studying the Word of God. With all of the... uh, you know, the technological things that we have today, there is no reason for you not knowing the Word. You can listen to the Word of God while you're driving, while you're exercising, while you're doing something. You can take the teaching that I've got, other people, and you can sit there and you can get into the Word. And you've got so many things to help you that really there are reasons why people don't do it, but there isn't an excuse. We need to be into the Word of God. And we need to study these things and to understand the difference between the way God related to people under the Old Testament and under the New Testament. It's not going to just happen organically. You have to study to know these things. This is what these first few verses are saying. Under the Old Covenant, it's very obvious if you've read much of the Bible at all that, man, if you broke a commandment under the Old Covenant, there was a consequence. There was judgment. God had smite you with the bots, the mildew, emrods, or whatever, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Under the New Covenant, we see a grace. And because we live under grace and God is not openly punishing us and doing things like that, some people just think, well, it doesn't matter. Now, we're now free from all of God's wrath And so there is no need to get in and to have to study the Word. But what's going to happen is if you don't know the truth, then you won't be set free and you will still live under the condemnation and the guilt and the punishment that was under the Old Covenant. And my experience is that this is where the vast majority of the body of Christ lives. They still are living without all of the benefits of this New Covenant that is ours. They don't know what they've got. As we get on into the book of Hebrews, I can guarantee you Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 are some of the most radical statements in the entire Word of God. And I'm not going to teach on it right now, but if I even mention it, I'll have to spend some time explaining it. I pray that you get these materials and you get into it, but we need to spend some time appreciating what Jesus has done for us. That's what these verses are saying. What Jesus did is greater than the old covenant 
of law. We have a new covenant now that surpasses it. As Paul said over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that the things that were glorious under that First Testament don't even have any glory compared to what we have as New Testament believers. If you go into 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, it says that all of these Old Testament people longed for what we have. They longed for it. They saw that there was coming a day that there was going to be something better than what they had. And yet there are many New Testament believers that would love to have the relationship with God that Moses had, where you could be in the presence of God so much that your face would re reflect light and the glory of God would shine. Did you know what we have is greater than that? Did you know Jesus never had his face uh, shine like that? Now, there was one time in the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew where he was fellowshipping with his father and he, in a sense, just kind of pulled back this curtain you know, Moses, when his face shone, he had to put a curtain over him, a, a cloth over him, a veil, because it was intimidating people. And so he put this veil. Jesus' body was his veil, and it really shielded people from seeing the real glory that was within. One time in private when he was with his father, and there was only three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, that saw it. But never in public did Jesus reflect glory the way that Moses did. And some people would think, well, then Moses had something better. No, Jesus was the glory of God, the express image of his person and the brightness of his glory, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. What Jesus had was so much greater, but it was hidden inside of that body. Did you know that what we have today is so infinitely greater than what the Old Testament people had, than what Moses had, Elijah, Elisha, David, any of them? It's, Jesus said this in the 11th chapter of the book of Matthew. He says, uh, John the Baptist was the greatest among all Old Testament people. There was never anybody born who compared to um, John, and yet he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. What a radical statement. There may be people watching this program today that you think maybe you are the least in the kingdom of heaven. Boy, it just doesn't seem like you are very sharp. You don't see much victory in your life at all. And yet Jesus said, if you are least in the kingdom of heaven, you're greater than John the Baptist, which means you're greater than what Moses had, Elijah, David, Jeremiah, Isaiah, anybody. What you have is awesome. The problem is we don't know what we have. And a lot of it comes because we don't understand the truths that are presented in the book of Hebrews where it is trying to show you what we have in Christ is so much superior to the Old Testament law. The average Christian is trying to live under the Old Testament law and the Old Testament law is incompatible with the New Testament grace. And so we've got to go through here and we've got to study and we've got to find out these truths. In verse 4, it says, God also bearing them witness. The previous verse had just said that we can't escape if we neglect what was spoken to us by Jesus and then confirmed by the apostles. And in verse 4, God also bared them, the apostles, witness both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. Boy, this is a powerful passage of Scripture. And this is talking about that they didn't just tell you in words about what God had done. They demonstrated it. That's what it's talking about. He bore witness both with signs and wonders and, and divers miracles, different miracles. You know, it says in Mark chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, those who believe on him, that these signs would follow them. They would lay hands on the sick. They would recover. They'd take up serpents. They'd drink any deadly thing. It shall not har harm them. They'll speak with new tongues. And then down there, I believe it's the 20th verse of the 16th chapter, it says that the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders following. The true preaching of the word of God will have miraculous um, results. Miraculous results. And this is one of the reasons that we aren't making a bigger impact on our society today than the people in the Bible days did because they had miraculous signs. Philip went down and he saw all kinds of miracles happen. And uh, they, because of that, the entire city believed on the Lord. 
uh, Peter and John went into the temple and saw the man raised up in the third chapter of the book of Acts. And on and on you could go. Uh, Paul saw Eutychus raised from the dead. Peter saw Dorcas raised from the dead. They saw miracles, and that confirmed the Word. If Jesus had to have miracles to confirm what He was saying was true, and if the apostles had to have miracles to confirm what they were saying was true, how arrogant is it on our part to think that somehow or another people are just going to be transformed by nothing but words from us? We need to demonstrate the power of God. You know, on television, it's hard for me to display that. If you go to our website, we've got, I didn't, don't even know, but probably over 50 uh, videos of people being raised from the dead, blind eyes being opened, people with multiple sclerosis being healed. We got two testimonies of that. People that are came, come out of wheelchairs and stuff. We see miracles happen. We actually had a Healing is Here conference, I think it was in 2019, where a woman came forward and put her 14-month-old baby on the stage who had died during the service. And we prayed for this baby, and this baby was raised from the dead in front of 2,000 people. We see miracles happen, and we must demonstrate the power of God today. And yet there's very, very few Christians, there's very few churches that really pray for the sick, that see the sick healed, that see miraculous things happen. This is what these verses are talking about, that God bore witness to Jesus, to the disciples, and likewise, He's still bearing witness today to people who are still preaching the true gospel. The Word should not be in... Word only, it ought to be in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I think it's around verse 20. And we've got to start demonstrating the power of God. So all of these things are saying that Jesus is superior to the old covenant because He is God manifest in the flesh. He had miracles confirmed the things that he was preaching that they were true, and the disciples also had the things that they were preaching confirmed. And in verse 5, it says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, I'm running out of time today. I'm not going to be able to get into this, but this begins to quote from Psalms chapter 8. And we're going to be talking about this. And this is once again going to be showing how that God made Jesus superior to the angels and uh, how that therefore His message that He preached is superior to the Old Testament law that was communicated through angels. So that's what He's beginning to say. We're out of time today, but I do want to encourage you once again to please get this new book that we've put out. This is a hardbound copy, 223 pages, of my living commentary that is on uh, digital, and we've put it into print. There's 223 pages. We're asking for a uh, suggested donation. We say suggested donation because we aren't sticking to that. We just encourage you to give something. But if you will send something, we will send that to you. We also have CDs, DVDs, or a USB that will take the audio and the video, and you can get those things, and all of those things are for a suggested donation. So listen to our announcer, and then please call or write today. You know, there's a lot of people that just assume because they believe that there's a God that they're saved. And the scripture says in James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, you believe that there's one God, you do well. But won't you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? That's a very sarcastic statement saying believing that there's a God is not anything that the devil hasn't done. It's more than just acknowledging that God exists. It's receiving Him as your Savior. And you know, today I talked about all of these things on our program. I encourage you to please call the number that you see on your screen. We've got people there that will take your call, and many of you maybe have been in that category where you acknowledge that God exists, but you've not really received salvation. Your heart hasn't been changed, and you need to receive that. So I would like to encourage you to please call the number that you see on your screen. We've got people that will pray with you, and we just want to help you. It would be a shame for you to be this close to salvation 
and not ever receive it. You need to make sure, and it's really simple. We can explain all that to you. So we've got that number on the screen. I encourage you to please call or check in with us. You can go to our website also and receive information about how to be born again. But we especially want to call and help you any way we can. And so please call the number that you see on your screen. I believe that we will be able to help you. Andrew is pleased to announce the release of his brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality. This hardback book includes all of Andrew's personal study notes and commentary on the book of Hebrews as compiled from Andrew's Living Commentary software. Discover the transformative truths of the book of Hebrews when you get Andrew's brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality, today. Andrew's complete series, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality, is available as a book, CD album, TV, DVD album, and USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available when you contact us. We also want to remind you of Andrew's Living Commentary software. The Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God and is available as a web-based software that you can access by computer or any mobile device. Get Andrew's Living Commentary today for $135. Go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. I want to let all of you know who are watching our program in Canada that we have a Canadian office. We also have a website, awmc.ca, and you can go there and you can get all of our materials sent to you from our Canadian office. You can become a partner with us and give and the money will stay right there to help us reach people in Canada. We would love to help you and minister to you any way we can. To learn more about the vision and mission of Andrew Womack Ministries Canada, be sure to visit our website at awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. The free materials offered by this ministry are made possible by the generous support of our friends and partners. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a grace partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Go to awmc.ca or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Harris is taking it to the next level in Canada. We are raising up leaders in the body of Christ by equipping students to stand on the word and walk in their calling. I love Karis because it prioritizes the word and that's what changes you. We stand on the word. Karis is a life changer. I have grown so much in the area that I know that God has called me to. If you would like to be a part of this, go to our website at karisbiblecollege.ca to find out more.